Ohio's Speaker Surprise. Welcome to Columbus on the Record. The drama about choosing a Speaker of the House of Representatives was not limited to Washington this week. It happened here in Columbus, but it only took one vote. In November, Republican members of the House gathered in private, and they all said they supported State Rep Derek Merrin of suburban Toledo to be the next Speaker. But six weeks later, 22 Republican State Reps and all 32 Democrats teamed up to deny Merrin the gavel. They instead gave it to Jason Stevens. Stevens took the oath of office with Democratic leader Allison Russo holding the Bible. Stevens, who was also a conservative Republican from far southeast Ohio, promised stable and inclusive leadership. I pledge to respect and to work with each and every one of you to address the many concerns of our state, and in particular, the concerns of your district, to recognize both challenges and opportunities, to develop real solutions, and to improve the lives of the people of Ohio. I pledge to always have an open door. I pledge to listen. And I encourage all to do the same. Joe Ingalls, what happened between mid-November and this week's vote? Well, if you ask some of the Republicans who defected and who voted for Stevens, they would tell you that they felt they weren't being heard. They said that they uh, felt that Marin was not uh, returning their phone calls, was not doing some of the things that, that they felt he should be doing going into that time. Uh, the Democrats, they found um, that maybe they could have a way to have some say in government. They're so far in the super minority there, and this gave them an opportunity to uh, kind of, you know, get a chance to get ahead if you, you know, by presenting a, a solid front, you know, all 32 votes in the, dem in the House went to Stevens. So it was interesting the way it played out. Julie, do we know who called whom first? Was it the Democrats who called Jason Stevens, or would Jason Stevens call the Democrats? Um, I don't know the answer to that, but I do think that uh, Jason Stevens had been on the slate of people looking at the speakership and had been uh, working with members trying to figure out a way to uh, become the leader. I, I understood that there had been some dealing between him and the other uh, non-winner to to try to share some of that support perhaps and and probably the Democrats saw an opportunity as Joe said to to suddenly go wow maybe uh, we could get something out of this and, and elevate someone who was slightly less um, far-right conservative perhaps than than Derek Maron. Mark is there a big difference politically in the, their positions on issues between Jason Stevens and Derek Maron? Not particularly, and what's more important is this is a much more conservative House of Representatives than it was just this last cycle. And so, of course, the Speaker matters. I know Speaker Stevens and his family, good person. It, that matters less than what this majority wants to do, and this majority is coming in with a mandate. And in future shows, we'll be talking about whether they and the governor are seeing eye to eye on things, because with, without respect to who the Speaker is, it's a conservative House that wants to see conservative change. So what do you think happened? Well, I think I, I've learned a little bit about when you're in a race, you keep sprinting until you hit the actual finish line. And so it looks as though perhaps someone stopped sprinting before he got to the finish line. And this is what happens. Big win for Democrats? Or is I, it just taking what they can get? Derek? Well, yes, it was a win for Democrats. I mean, this is a true picture of bipartisanship. When, when you look at where Democrats have been, our, our position right now, it's a supermajority with the Republicans. There's really no way Democrats would get anything done in committees, in uh, passing bills. So with this unity with the now new speaker, Jason Stevens, there's hope that there might be some things that they can agree on. To get something, you have to give something. What did Jason Stevens give Joe to get Democratic support? Do we know specifically what he promised? Yeah, well, Democratic Minority Leader Allison Russo said that um, one of the things that uh, that they were concerned about 
was um, education and education funding in particular. They didn't want the bill that had passed that, that has a new fair funding plan, they call it. Uh, they didn't want that to be torn apart in this legislature. You also got to remember that there's a thing called the backpack bill, which would expand vouchers. And uh, teachers unions who back Democrats really didn't want that uh, Democrats didn't want that. So they got something there. And also uh, there was the concern about are the Republicans going to make it harder for citizens to pass ballot initiatives? And uh, there's some indication that maybe that was brought up in those discussions as well. Yeah, Stevens wasn't a fan of that in the last session, that 60 percent threshold. You had to get 60 percent of the vote and an amendment referendum to have it pass. It didn't go anywhere in the lame duck. They were hoping to do it quickly this session. Right. And it's it. I think Brian Stevens, who sponsored that, has even said on Twitter and confirmed that uh, Stevens uh, bargained that away uh, in exchange for Democratic support. It was clearly unpopular, but not only with Democrats. I mean, our ballot has been used by uh, people of all political stripes to to pass uh, measures that they don't think the le legislature is acting on. Mark, there's a lot of, they picked a new uh, chairman of the party today. There was talk of censuring the, the 22 Republicans who voted for Stevens and with the Democrats. Is this all going to blow over? Is this just bad feelings? Or is this, a like we're seeing in Washington, a real division between some in the, some and others in the Republican Party? The Republican Party is somewhat divided right now. For years, Democrats were divided between some moderates and the left, and the left has won, and the Democratic Party is a party of the left. Republicans still have some divisions. We're seeing it in Washington. We're seeing it in Ohio. Sometimes it's personality-driven based on a former president or a particular speaker candidate. Other times, it's whether you want to be more establishment or whether you want to see genuine change in the way government runs. And so that causes our party to have an inter-family fight. But... Um, I think the fight will pass and we will see good governance from this Republican legislature here in Ohio. Derek, Democrats tried this before. They helped Larry Householder become speaker. Circumstances are different. We don't know what's going to happen down the road. Sure. Didn't work out for them really then, at least on the long term. Does, is there a fear that this isn't going to work out either? Well, it didn't work out th for them then because uh, Larry Householder, you know, allegedly committed this crime that he's on trial for right now. But I think the real story here is how much of a master negotiator Alison Russo, our minority leader, has become in getting all of the Democratic members to vote for a speaker that she felt could lead the, Democratic, the, the Democrats in a direction where that they could get something done. And really, the, the, the winners of all of this are the voters in, in, in the people of Ohio. Is it a bad thing to have a bipartisan speaker? I mean, it, it never happens. We're not I don't think it will. I mean, I, I wouldn't think it would be truly bipartisan at all. Um, I think that maybe the Democrats might get a better shot on some issues. Mm -hmm. But you've got to remember, this is a very uh, conservative um, legislature in, in the House and the Senate. And a lot of these folks, as you said, are mm -hmm. further to the right than the, the previous legislature. One of the things that I think took Stevens over the finish line, as Mark says, is that he is a, uh, from local government. He's been a county auditor and that he understands how government works. Um, he's not really, as I understand it, been involved in sort of the culture war type issues. He sponsored some pretty practical sort of bills, and I think that that's the kind of thing that um, maybe tip some of the votes in his direction. And he could be speaker for six years, whereas uh, his opponent would only have been for two. And so that, that also makes a difference, people, because flipping the speaker's race and then having to have it happen yet again could have been an unstabilizing factor, a destabilizing factor for the caucus. And he could thank Democrats twice because it was Democrats who made Larry Householder the speaker, which denied Ryan Smith the speakership. He left the legislature, and who took his place? Jason Stevens. Stevens. Now we can thank Democrats again for becoming speaker. So twice, Christmas cards for Democrats for, for two occasions anyway. Now that the House has a new speaker, state reps and senators and the governor have been sworn in, lawmakers soon will get back to legislating. Even after a busy lame duck session, there are many big things to tackle in the next several months. The biggest is the two-year state budget, but there is abortion legislation, possibly education system changes, and the issue that just will not go away redistricting. Julie Carr-Smythe, the budget obviously is the priority. Will anything else 
interfere with deliberations on that between now and July. Um, what history tells us is that will take the, the front seat for the first half of the year. Um, I, as I understand it, the redistricting issue will have to come back, but it really can't do that until mid-year anyway. And so they'll probably set that on the side burner. Um, but there are some other things uh, out there. You know, there's some talk about the education piece and what's going to happen with that school funding element. There is uh, a push to fix, if you will, our, our abortion, the functioning of our abortion near ban uh, in ways that might perhaps uh, address some of the issues that came about when it was in effect for that short time. Uh, and and raise so many questions. So I think that people want to address that as well. Joe, was there a hope that some of these bills could be addressed to 60% threshold for amendment changes? There was there was a hope this would these would be addressed before the budget season begins, like in February. Well, there's no one saying they're not going to be, but you've got to remember what else is going on. It's not just all about the legislation here. There's going to be things going on. We have a trial coming up that I think all four of us, five of us, are going to be real interested in watching. That's going to take some air out of the room. It's the Larry you, Householder trial. The Larry so Householder trial, yeah. and, and that's going to be going on. We're also going to have a lot of things at state government level that we're dealing with as far as how to deal with um, the, you know, money uh, uh, it, with the budget, the money plans that you put in place. You know, the governor is saying he, he has some big ideas for mental health, behavioral health, those kind of things. So there's going to be that. We're also dealing with uh, new people in the governor's cabinet. Um, there's a lot going on. Mark, how big a tax cut and where will the tax cut come in the budget? Because we know there's one coming. It's, they never miss a chance to, to cut the taxes when the Republicans are in charge at any budget year. So where does it come? Income tax? We can only hope that the people will be allowed to keep more of their money, <laughs> right? Uh, listen, I think what we'll see is Governor DeWine now has his legacy on the line. And so we're going to see this governor stepping up with some pretty bold ideas. He's always wanted to be governor. Now he's got his eight years and he's gonna be doing some interesting stuff. And so it may include uh, tax cuts and letting people keep more of their money, but I also think you're gonna see him boldly acting in the areas he's always cared about. So give, me a, give us an example. Well, he's, he's always been concerned about child welfare. So I think you're gonna see him leaning into that. He's always been a strong voice for a reasonable approach on guns, on the red flag thing. He's going to revisit that again. Now, he's, he's a strong Second Amendment advocate, but there are some ways that he can reach out with the legislature and make some changes in the areas of guns. I think he'll do that now as well. Derek, in the last year and a half, maybe two years, after the initial COVID response, the legislature pretty much tied the governor's hands. Do you see the governor taking that more forceful role, and will he be successful with this legislature? Again, as, as, as Mark indicated, he just got reelected. He has four years and he's not coming back to the governor's office, right? So he will be in a position where he can make some bold moves. And, um, you know, I, I think his veto pen is always ready to go if, if, there's, if there's issues mm -hmm. that the legislature puts out there that's just not in line with his values. And we can't forget that he was delivered a, um, a, a marijuana uh, issue that yeah. they now have four months to act on, too. Well, let's get to that. State lawmakers are on the clock to act on legal recreational marijuana, or the issue could go before voters. As part of a legal settlement, Secretary of State Frank LaRose officially submitted to lawmakers an initiated statute sponsored by the Coalition to Regulate Marijuana Like Alcohol. It would legalize social marijuana for people over the age of 21. Lawmakers have until early May to approve the proposed law as is, or the group promises to collect more signatures if they do, legal marijuana for fun would go before voters in November. Mark Weaver, Senate President Huffman says he doesn't want any part of this. Is this destined for the ballot? It may well be go to the ballot, but let's remember the, this. The last time we had a major challenge of getting signatures and petitions done was the House Bill 6 debacle. And we saw so many fights about signatures and blockers and counter blockers and hiring away petition gatherers. You could see that happen here as well. Now, I don't know if there's money lined up on both sides the way there was with House Bill 6, but we have not yet had a ballot issue put on the ballot statewide since that House Bill 6 attempt, and largely it's because it's so difficult to get good valid signatures. My guess is marijuana growers, Julie, marijuana retailers, they have cash, out-of-state cash, perhaps they'll be able to get the money to at least collect the signatures, you think? I would think so. Um, 
and it's, it is interesting what Mark says about ho House Bill 6 because some of the pushback on, on that was obviously tangled up in the householder uh, uh, mess, I guess, and, and uh, we've found now that some of that interference was uh, illegal, basically. And so I think that it is still very hard to get on our ballot, though, and uh, who knows, uh, but I believe that it... I mean, there's some incentive for lawmakers to act on it themselves because they because they can then control sort of what's in state law. And yeah, that's what happened last time, Joe, with the yeah. medical marijuana. There was talk of going to the ballot, and state mm -hmm. lawmakers said, hold on, we see it's going to pass, let's do it our way, and they passed a legal medical marijuana bill. They want to change that now, make it looser. But do you ever see them going, this legislature going to make pot basically legal in all cases? No. I don't. But I see them kind of going that direction where they could set an avenue, just like they did with the medical marijuana. They could set, they could come up with the plan that would set an avenue to allow that. And it would be um, specific. It would be in a way that they still have control over some of it. Um, having what, Cal, you know, California or Colorado or some of the other states that have legal marijuana, are we going to see it done the same way. Oh no, I don't think the, the Ohio lawmakers would go for that, but I think they would try to do enough that they could keep it off the ballot. So that will be the sweet spot. The world has not ended in the state of Michigan. It's been legal there for some time, marijuana, several states, Massachusetts, California, many states. Yes. And it's, it's been Colorado. Well, the world, it's coming, hasn't, it's, the world hasn't ended, but there are the higher usages now of children getting access particularly to the edibles and mm -hmm. overdoses. The THC level in the marijuana is much higher than it was years ago. So the world hasn't ended, but addiction rates have increased and law enforcement is very worried about uh, mm -hmm. what it, taking what is essentially a gateway drug and making it available to everybody, including children. Marijuana has been here forever. Uh, people want it. I'm not, I'm not personally advocating for it, but people want it. And the will of the people will prevail if, if this gets on the ballot. And as you said, several states have already passed it. Um, and if the state can control it, then I think that that's better off for everybody. 10% is the, gonna be the tax on this, correct, Julie? And this, is, this seems to be a smart campaign right off the bat. Co regulate marijuana like alcohol. We've had alcohol regulations for years. I don't, we don't know about state minimum pricing though on marijuana, if that's gonna be part of it or not. But it's a pretty simple, there's no monopoly, there's no, it's gonna be, make it like beer. Right, I mean, that's, I mean, that would be their best argument, as you say, but it, as Joe points out, I mean, the political climate isn't such that they wanna be doing that. At the same time, there's an awful lot of political cover for people all the way across the political spectrum to pass this. It's, it's changed nationally, it's not what it once was uh, in terms of, uh, it's being seen as more some sort of balance between the social ills of usage and, and the social costs of things like incarcerating nonviolent offenders and things like that. There is, a, there is a medical marijuana change proposal that would loosen, make it, basically you could use medical marijuana for anything that could be helped by medical marijuana. That's pretty broad. Is this an attempt, Joe, to, to sort of thwart this effort. That might be the vehicle they use to do this. I, I mean, they, they really, the Ohio lawmakers, they, they've been very clear that they don't like the idea of um, marijuana, legalizing marijuana for everyone, but they, they do like um, the medical marijuana enough that they would be willing to relax it. I think the thing we have to remember though is Ohio is in the middle of a bunch of states that allow marijuana. So, you know, we're not sitting here on an island all by them ourselves and, and people are going to other states to uh, get marijuana and bring it back illegally. And, but that does cut into the amount of money Ohio can make. So there's, there's some sweet spot there to find. And, and the problem that you have right now, we already have a workforce issue. But I've heard from some, from, from some employers that they can't get people to come and work for them because they, they don't allow marijuana. So if you, if you already have this problem, at least put some safeguards in place where you can regulate it and you can make some rules around it so that so that uh, 
folks understand what the, what the rules are and it's clear. This is like the gambling debate all over again, right, Mark? We started with casinos, then we went to racinos. Now, as of January 1st, we can bet on our phones. Yes, it, it does seem like a slippery slope. And what's interesting in this case is they took a finding from a poll where people wanted to regulate marijuana like alcohol and named their committee that, which is one of the more common uses of taking one of your persuasion points and making it the name of your campaign in hopes that people on friendly uh, outlets will actually use that phrase where people will go, well, why shouldn't we? They're just exactly the same. There's no difference at all. And so they've achieved their goal. All right, let's get to our last topic. The selective adherence to Ohio's home rule requirement continued this week. This time, home rule won. Governor DeWine vetoed a bill that would have prevented local governments from banning sales of flavored tobacco and flavored vaping products. The city of Columbus recently banned those sales. Supporters of the ban on bans say such rules should be made statewide. Governor DeWine said flavored tobacco products entice young people to smoke, and he said he would support a statewide ban. Derek Clay, in a year from now, we could have legal marijuana, but menthol cigarettes could be illegal. How strange is that? We've seen stranger things in our yeah. state, right? <laughs> but let me, let me just go through real quickly some of the other uh, some, of, some of the governor's home rule history. So in, in June of 2022, the governor signed a bill that would took away the, the ability for cities to impose rent control measures. The governor also signed into law legislation blocking cities from imposing bans and fee or fees on the uses of plastic bags. In 2019, the governor also uh, signed a bill that would cut state funding for controlling traffic cameras. So is this really about home rule? And, 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 and I, I understand where the governor is come from, coming from in terms of wanting to protect kids from the flavors, but if this is truly about home rule, let's be consistent about it. Is it more, he, the governor said this is more about enticing kids. He really didn't mention home rule too much. Right, in his, and his as conference. Mark mentions, that's yeah. one of his key issues is, is children's issues. He's got a, a huge family. He values those kind of, um, well, family values a lot. And in addition to that, he was wanting to be consistent with his record from the U.S. Senate when he had really fought this issue uh, of access uh, of these flavored type items. I mean, he, he's believed in it at, at a core level for a long time. The Supreme Court has allowed the erosion. It's in the Constitution. Home rules in the Ohio Constitution, mm -hmm. but court rulings have allowed it to be bent, the rule to be bent. What is their reasoning behind that, Mark, over the years? Home rule, which is the power between the state government and the local government, is a lot like federalism, which is the power between the national government and the states. It's complex. It's a give and take. So everybody's got a role. All of the decision makers has a role. And the governor's playing his. And so when the courts step in and, and draw people back, um, that's their check and balance. But what, I, what I've seen over the years is home rule is not a simple thing where always local governments get to have their say. Every player gets to have their say, and the governor's just had his. He also, this week, um, allowed local governments to regulate. He signed a bill that allows local governments to regulate wind farms. Right. So as, as, as Derek, he's kind of over around, but fracking, you can do it anywhere. Yeah, you, well, yeah. It, 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 yep, like you all said, it just, you know, depends on the situation. <laughs> so how serious is he? Is he going to push a statewide ban on these sales? Uh, he said he hasn't talked to any lawmakers yet about it, but uh, he, he was clear that that's what he would like to see and, and this would be consistent with the way he has handled issues like this in the past. Uh, he's very health oriented and uh, so I guess we'll just wait to see if, if any of the lawmakers would pick it up and carry it. Uh, but there's going to be a lot of opposition if he tries to do that because there's a lot of uh, money on the other side. So You talked about how marijuana was like gambling. This is like the smoking ban all over again, Derek. I mean, when the smoking ban was first put in place, it was the cities that did it first. And then if you look at the city of Columbus map, you could be, you, you could smoke in one restaurant, but if you cross the street, you're in a township. Right. And you, or the other way around, you could smoke in a Columbus restaurant, go across the street, and you couldn't smoke in Clinton Township's restaurant. Right. Is a statewide ban to solve that problem? Yeah, a statewide ban would essentially solve that problem. Uh, but again, to you know, to Joe's point, you know, there's a lot of money on the line here. We're talking about tax revenue. Uh, we're talking about you know retail sales of, of those of those types of products. So it will definitely be a fight if the legislature tries to you know. To over override that veto. Yeah. 
You know, you see a statewide bank mark with this legislature? No. They have the other priorities to do, and then the budget will hit, and that will, that will take over everything. All right, let's get to our final off-the-record parting shots. And Mark Weaver, you're up first. We saw a story last week where some states are so generous with their public welfare benefits that some families make as much as $120,000 a year. It's ironic that some politicians have worked so hard so their constituents won't have to work at all. People want a safety net, not a hammock with Bluetooth speakers. Okay. Derek. Uh, sad day, January 6th. You know, just want to uh, commemorate those that lost their lives in the, in the insurrection. And uh, happy to announce, well, everybody knows that DeMar Hamlin is, is, seems to be okay. So we're happy about that. Absolutely. Julie. Um, I'm just intrigued to watch as Jason Stevens tries to uh, not only recruit a leadership team, but as also needs to hire a staff. He needs to make committees. He needs to set some session dates. And um, uh, you know, he's not the only person in the country that's dealt with these sorts of uh, these sorts of divisions within their legislature. And so far, they have managed to do better than Washington. Okay. Joe? One of the things I noticed this week, and it kind of goes back to what Derek said, but you know, when Derek came, when, when this whole thing happened, um, you know, the whole nation seemed to get behind him, including the other team. And it was a moment of unity. And it yeah. comes on a week when we've had so much, you know, everyone's at each other's throats in the state house or, or you know nationally and it just it, it was kind of interesting that we can have unity and have you know total disarray in the same week absolutely uh, my off the record comment wednesday woSU and the columbus metropolitan club continue our series called democracy in crisis this session will look at the future of democracy what will politics look like 10 years from now I'll moderate the forum, longtime national political scientist Kyle Kondik and Ohio Common Causes Catherine Terser will join me. It's this coming Wednesday at noon at the Grange Audubon Center. More information, go to our website, wosu.org events. That's Columbus on the Record for this week. Thanks to our panel. Thanks to our crew. We'll see you next week.